Okay, so hi everyone. This will be kind of like an introduction to permaculture. I know this is going to be a pitch. So how I'm going to angle it is that what I'm pitching is how permaculture actually helped me achieve massive transformational approach, a massive, massive transformation in only a span of a year and how you can do the same thing, basically. So uh, in order to walk you through that, I have to talk a little bit about my journey because this is all a journey. Every one of us will have our own individual journey. And the physical journey, meaning ever since I physically launched the thing, was only one year, like a year back, June of 2021. But the whole thinking process took around eight years. So most of the work is in the thinking process. And if you get that done, then the implementation, though difficult, um, it would be a bit smoother. So uh, I am an architect, but I am a hardcore nature lover. Um, so in 2011, I took my, uh, I finished my architecture license exam. And what happened was that I was extremely exhausted after my thesis, but my dad still made me complete his, he made me do his project, his permaculture project. And that was the very first uh, permaculture course that was being offered in our city back in 2009. Back then, permaculture was essentially unheard of. Um, and my dad, maybe out of his wisdom, made me do his project. And that basically kickstarted my whole permaculture journey out of brainwashing, positive brainwashing. Um, but even though I took, I was essentially a freshly licensed architect, I, I boycotted my profession. And the reason being was because being a nature lover, I didn't like how my profession was very detrimental to nature and the things that I was passionate about. So I actually went through a, a dark period, around two years of watching all sorts of nature documentaries, learning about climate change, pollution, and all of those things. But it was very dark because if you watch too much of those things then you get into like a, a, a downward spiral of hopelessness. So in order to get myself out of that spiral, I decided to do something positive um, and something, something that I could do, even if it's just a tiny, tiny, tiny step I knew that I have to educate myself and many of the things was definitely not covered in my course. Um, maybe it could be found in books in the library. So the very, I was already working in Singapore at that time. I was just waiting for my very first paycheck so that the first thing I could buy out of my paycheck was a library card, uh, $50. I could remember everything. That was the first thing that I bought. And then in the weekends, I would spend it in the library, which is awesome here in Singapore. They have amazing libraries. And at night, after I come home from work, I would just read all these books and in the weekend spend time in between these rows of shelves trying to learn as much as I can. Ultimately, I, I realized it's not enough and then I, could, I should probably get some kind of formal education. So um, two years after that, I took my master's in National University of Singapore. The topic was on integrated sustainable design. Um, and this is also how I met my husband. He's also an architect. He also focuses on sustainable design um, in urban areas, whereas I focus in rural areas, where is my true passion. But even though I, I just uh, graduated from my master's degree, I also realized it's not enough. There was something missing that I was looking for. There was something that I was looking for that I haven't seen yet. It was essentially a framework so if it's not in the libraries, if it's not in the books, if it's not in my degree, so where am I going to find it? So I have to create it myself. And I could remember the exact memory of when things flowed out of nowhere. There were two memories, one of which uh, I went, it was after a whole night of binging nature documentaries and it was 2 a.m. and it was a darkened room and I was like crying my eyes out because I don't know there was just like some energy going through me and then all of the ideas came flooding and um, that was what sparked the idea of this project which I'm going to I'm going to share with you now the other point was when I was a bit more logical and the thinking and the actual framework actually came into place so this is the actual stuff the initial framework that I was writing down in my iPad in one of the malls here. And to this day, it is still the framework that we use. So this framework essentially, oh, before I go into that, um, around the same time, I told you it was a journey. <laughs> uh, two years after that, um, my parents alerted me of a beautiful piece of property uh, in Carmen, Bohol. It's the same area as where Merli is from. 
Um, and then when I saw it, I instantly fell in love. And I knew that this is going to be the place where I'm going to test out this framework, implement, implement my own thing, and basically do trial and error, fail, learn from my mistakes. And basically, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So then and there, I decided to purchase this piece of land. And this is basically when the Regenesis project was born. So Regenesis is a play of words. Uh, it means from the word regen, so to regenerate, but it also means re-genesis. So re-genesis in Genesis book in the Bible, that was where mankind belonged in the Garden of Eden, where it was very abundant. So regenesis is basically returning to Eden and returning to that state of abundance and oneness with God and nature. So our mission is to heal nature through people and heal people through nature and this kind of bi-directional healing is so important because we could do it one way we could do it just one way we go out and heal nature through large-scale restoration but that also means that we're not addressing the core of the problem which is basically the disconnection between humans and nature in my mind it's much more important to heal this disconnection first um, and then the rest will basically follow through so Nature needs us, but we also need nature, and we could find healing in restorative work. So in a gist, this is essentially our framework, and every single element of this framework has a purpose, and that purpose is to, is to create the largest possible impact um, and transformation in multiple, uh, multiple sectors and multiple areas of you know, human development. So the first is that, we have to start and we have to start with degraded land and that is because more than 50 percent of the land surface is, is already degraded maybe we're not even um uh, we don't realize it yet because the climate change narrative only focuses on emission but there's a huge potential of the earth to restore then we basically bring nature back to life and when we do that we do that within a framework of um, creating regenerative enterprises or regenerative industries or business models. Because yes, we could ask for funding um, to restore, uh, to, to, to basically fund our work, but we will also miss out on learning how to actually transform the economic, you know, the, the economics of it all so that the economics will also change to become regenerative. So that is why we have this aspect of our project. And then finally, if it was our economic systems or industries and human systems, including us who brought about this degradation, then we, be, we definitely have to be part and parcel and play a key role in its restoration. So we have to essentially reintroduce human stewardship back to nature and figure out what it actually means to be proper good stewards to nature. And how do we know if everything we're doing is working? We should see trends. We should be able to see upward trend. The goal, is health and resilience of all of these living systems over time. We're not saying that, oh, we have to restore the, this forest into exactly what it was 10 years ago. We may not know what it was 10 years ago, but we do know that nature in, is innately healthy and resilient. So we just want to see that this upward trajectory of ecosystems um, and socioeconomic systems being increasingly healthier and resilient over time. So this is essentially our framework and all components are essential for massive transformation. So in order to take key steps towards that transformation, we actually became the first and only um, ecosystem restoration camp in the Philippines. There are only around 53 all over the world. I think they're very selective because they want to um, choose projects that are, you know, that can create a multiplier effect. Not all projects can do that. So we're very lucky that we were chosen as the only one in the Philippines. So we have a, a big role to play. And um, through uh, my background in permaculture and also in design, uh, we created our ecosystem master plan, essentially our permaculture plan, which is very different, by the way, uh, compared to how architects design. Essentially, you are designing with nature, learning how to think like nature, to design like nature. So you have to break, the, you have to break down all assumptions of what we thought we knew. Um, so the framework that we were using here is essentially permaculture. So at this point, I should explain what permaculture is. Permaculture is also a play of words. 
it means both permanent agriculture and also permanent agriculture. Because if we have permanent agriculture, then we have permanent culture because we need human civilizations need food to survive. And this actually originated from where Dr. Karen Smith is from, from Australia. Um, uh, but essentially, long story short, permaculture is a system of, of designing and living in a way that is aligned to nature, in a way that is aligned to how nature and living systems are inherently healthy and resilient and abundant and all of, the, uh, all of those things. So um, since I was on the topic of uh, creating massive transformation, we also didn't want to stop at only planting trees and then focusing on restoring ecosystems. Our human systems also have to transform to become regenerative as opposed to de degenerative, degenerative. And my thinking is that, the thinking behind this is that if it was human systems, meaning our food systems, our tourism industry, the way we do our business, the way we develop land, the way we educate our kids, if it, if it were these systems that brought about these problems, then it should be these systems that should bring about its transformation or else we will always have these two camps, the destroyers and then the earth healers, and we can never move forward like that. So uh, this is why the Regenesis Project has all of these five tracks simultaneous. So in the beginning, we had nothing. Um, I only had my savings. Uh, we didn't have a large pot of money. So we have to be really, really resourceful with what we could do and identify high, uh, small actions that could create like high impact. One of which was introducing this concept of ecosystem restoration camping. And camping is popular in the Philippines, but camping to restore the earth is not. So um, we were quite nervous on how to, how to even go about this concept people even people even come or they'll find it weird like we're not just tree huggers and all of that how can we how can we create value out of this um long story short it was a massive success um all of our monthly camps would sell out under 24 hours and this was because we were forced to really use our creativity and resourcefulness to turn it into a positive experience as opposed to oh this is just a charity for nature you have to rethink the whole thing in order for things to be effective and for people to want to go as opposed to like, please come and help me. Please come and help me. They would have to want to go. And they not only came, but they actually paid for it. So that's how we know that it's working. And not only did they come and paid for it, they're coming again in the next camp and then bringing their friends. So those are the kind of metrics of success that you want to look out for. So this is the Chocolate Hills, in, which is what Bohol is famous for. It's a... It's a famous landmark, and these are our, our visitors, our campers. We have local tourists, foreign tourists from all over the world who come and help us restore nature, essentially. It's actually the exact opposite of ecotourism, because with ecotourism, you already have nature, you already have pristine environment, and then you try to bring in tourists, um, but you do it in a way that minimizes your impact. But we are bringing, we're bringing tourists where there is no nature, and then using their help to actually bring nature back to life. So it's a, a brand new paradigm shift. But because of that, because we're doing something that no one else has done before, it reaches the ears of the you know, provincial uh, tourism agency, the regional uh, tourism agency, because we were doing something that was essentially unheard of, but also was already starting to gain traction in the global community. So, what they plant is actually dependent on our restoration master plan. So depending on what we need to plant and by when, we actually design themes around our camps. And then, of course, this was also designed using permaculture principles. It's the, 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 the whole idea is that we use their hands. It's their hands that actually help, um, help it uh, bring it to life. And then... Um, it's not only, you know, like the actual restoration activity, but they also have some form of another form of healing, another form of unique experience, whether it's through um, something that helps with their mental health. And that is also one of the reasons why many campers come back, because they reported that a month's worth worth of stress was gone from camping with us so that's what we want to hear they also come back because they um, feel a sense of community or the sense of purpose a sense of meaning there's all sorts of hundreds of reasons why they come back 
but all of that is good because that means that we are creating all sorts of value from this one activity that transforms human life in many many ways and the other thing that we also did was we want to transform um industries in the philippines that are taking off one of which was the bamboo industry um bamboo industry in the philippines is becoming more and more popular and there are a lot of players but in order for us to create high impact transformation we have to look at the whole bamboo life cycle and to start where it's the most start where it matters the most which is basically um, the nursery or the, the the mother plants or the the seeds so we invested we we really made sure to make the investment of setting up our own nursery um, of different kinds of bamboo varieties that could use for construction or for other ecological functions and because we invested in really trying to um, experiment and perfect our propagation techniques that also led to other opportunities as well so we became a learning site we officially became a learning site we get all sorts of visitors from private sector public sector who come and visit our nursery and to figure out what we're doing because what we're doing is again different so that's what i mean by if you focus on trying to make an impact and um understanding where to intervene in the system then you could create influence where you actually didn't realize that you will be creating influence and eventually, when that bamboo grows, uh, it will be integrated as part of large-scale ecosystem restoration, uh, restoration of, you know, entire watersheds and all of that. And then once that uh, bamboo is harvested, then it doesn't stop there. We're also going to use the opportunity to also transform and elevate a lot of bamboo industries in the Philippines from crafts that are... You know, it's the same. It's like the, it's like crafts that have, that look the same for the past many decades, and uh, haven't had the opportunity to maybe elevate itself or to be, to be um, put into an international market. So we're trying to elevate local craftsmanship. We're trying to elevate local bamboo architecture because like, we're still we're still architects. So we are in every single aspect of this plan and of the value chain. We're we're striving for transformation. We're striving for, um, you know, where could we do things better or how can we challenge the way things have always been done and to create something that is better for everyone. But then in December of last year, uh, a mega typhoon hit. That was Typhoon Haiyan. That was the worst typhoon and calamity that we experienced in living memory, literally in living memory. So... All of that good work from the last year uh, was put on pause because everyone was trying to recover. But I also believe that everything happens for good reason. And even though something is as catastrophic and as deadly as a calamity like this one, it's also an incredible learning opportunity. And we would really be remiss if we don't take the lessons of a calamity, especially a calamity as important as, as deadly as the one that we have faced and even wildfires all around the world. So we took a step back and sometimes it's really necessary to you know, step away, go back to the drawing board. Not necessarily that you're trying to reinvent the whole thing, but to realign yourself back into the big picture. And the big picture is that climate change is, <laughs> I don't want to say climate change is real. Obviously climate change is real, but like the impacts of climate change is already happening. And uh, we should basically plan as if what we're going to experience in the future is already happening now. And that this catastrophe that just hit us, this is going to be our new normal. So how are we going to survive this? So we have to relook at the entire system holistically again, again, using the lens of nature, using the lens of permaculture and understand why is it like this? Why, why are there droughts and then there are floods and then wildfires and all of those things? So um we re-looked at our entire framework and then ma made an even bigger emphasis on restoring entire watersheds you know because of all of the impacts climate impacts in the philippines at least most of them have to do with water storms floods droughts and all of that and once we understand that if we think holistically then we we would know that 
restoring our watershed should be our number one priority. It just so happens that we don't really think that way or our municipal plan, or not municipal planning, but our national development doesn't really think that way. But that's also why we're trying to influence, trying to influence as higher up as we can. And this also uh, made us realize that it's so important to track our work and measure metrics. So if we are very serious about like all of these ecosystem health, uh, ecological health that we want to see that then it's also important that we start taking measurements in order to know if whether or not we're on the right track. So we actually um, created like a small team of volunteer researchers who helped us like collect eco ecological indicators on soil, carbon, biodiversity and water um, so that we could basically track our progress year after year. And the good thing is that even after only a few years of doing some ecological work, we're already starting to see changes, changes in soil structure, which also leads to changes in biodiversity mix, even without planting trees. We're just, these are just changes in, um, like, uh, in biodiversity that we have seen. So that means that the, sis the system is now able to take on more life. And that is what we want because we need our land to be fertile again in order to grow the food that we need and create the livelihoods that we need to support uh, our current farmers and future generations to come in the face of climate change. So from this bigger plan, we started to zoom in a little bit and look at like, okay, what kind of other uh, transfer, what, what kind of other projects can we do at other scales? So we also realized that focusing on the home or the home level is also important. So we also focused on designing at the home level. So if, if restoring and designing permaculture at the watershed level looks like that, but what, what will it look like if it's just a home? If you only have like one hectare or even less, in my case, I only have a balcony, but I'm still adamant that you could still practice permaculture even if all you have is a balcony and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it to people. Yeah, so um, uh, so what's happening now is that our, our home, our model home is under the construction, but even though it's under construction, we're already growing vegetables. So I guess we're doing things in, in reverse because home is not just about, you know, the physical it's, it's the life that you live in there. It's the life that you live in there and the kind of lifestyle that you want to embody and the kind of lifestyle that you want your community to embody, you know, become more self-sufficient because fertilizer is getting more and more expensive. Um, the cost of everything is getting more and more expensive. We have to grow our own food and we have to produce all the things that we need to grow our own food. But how are we going to teach that if we're not going to do it ourselves? So that is what we've been focusing on. And not just growing our own food, basically... Every aspect of the home that could become regenerative through permaculture, we will look into. So we compost all of our, of our food scraps and it goes back to our soil. And that's why our soil is very black and healthy and our leafy green vegetables are getting out of control because they're a little bit too, he <laughs> a little bit too healthy. So we always ask people, please come and help us harvest vegetables. We can't eat all, <laughs> we can't eat all of it. Yeah, and me and my husband, um, we have a background in you know, energy, carbon and water. So we also look at those systems as well. And some of these people are here. So that is Patrick, that is Dale, that is Christine. They are our students and uh, we have had a wonderful journey with them so far. Um, hopefully they found permaculture interesting so far but it's only the beginning of the journey it's a journey um so we have to we this has been our plan all along to teach because what is the point of doing all of these things if we don't replicate it and the most powerful way to replicate it is really through the youth because they're the ones who have really have the high capacity to transform so we want to focus on women and youth and uh, when it comes to teaching permaculture, sometimes we have to go back to the basics, like how to even read land, how to even read and understand nature, because how, how, how on earth are we going to design productive systems using nature? We don't, know, we don't even know how to, we don't even know how to listen to nature. How can we apply the lamp, the lamp principle to nature, the voiceless? So that is uh, also a, a critical skill set. And then they have to learn how to different ways to propagate, different ways to, you know, install water systems and everything. Yeah, getting their hands dirty. But uh, good thing they they love that part. So that has been the journey so far. Where we are at now, we, me and my husband, are taking a step back to see where we could influence the most. 
where would be we have to take stock of what our resources are what we're good at and then see like what what would be the biggest impact we could create with that with those resources so we realized that me being both an architect and a permaculture designer and my husband both of us together focusing both on rural systems and urban systems we have a, a, a unique set of skill sets that we could offer we could offer to developers we could offer to municipalities we could offer and when we when we talk about a skill sets or value we we don't even have to be a charity people will want to pay for these skill sets frankly speaking and you would have skill sets as, as well that people would be wanting to pay for if we just learn how to uncover them so uh what we hope to do is to create this multiplier effect of more and more projects that are implementing permaculture and moving towards climate resilience and maybe even influence entire cities or nations and whatever so in the span of a year we were surprised to find that we already got an audience with congress we already got an audience with the governor and then having heard our story and our vision without even having to convince without having to say like please help us out here they're the ones who want to be a part of this or they're the ones who want to ask like can you please review this bill or do you think that you could be a, a consultant for, for 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 the climate change committee or all of those things? I, I never have, would have expected that I would be uh, we would be getting those questions in a short span of time. But that that's because our framework was permaculture. Our framework is holistic thinking, and uh, our focus was really on massive transformation with as little input as possible and working with whatever we have. So through this course, this pitch is almost over, you could look at it as like, <clears throat> it's, it's either you have, you you actually do want to, uh, you actually do have a physical project, in which if you have a physical project, then you could have a physical design. And there are all sorts of like projects, wonderful projects all over the world, wherever you are, in Colombia, in, in the US, in Asia, wherever, there uh, you can implement permaculture. So, uh, you could look at it in terms of like the physical implementation of it, but you could also look at it in terms of like implementing the principles into whatever whatever project you have, even if it's something that is a social project, even if it's like a knowledge product, even if it's like your own worldview, even if any 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 product any project that you want to look into, there is a room for permaculture for that, and that is actually why it is my conscious choice. Um, that permaculture is my default worldview. Permaculture is my default worldview, and that has basically changed my life in the past 10 years because essentially what is happening here and what you will learn through this course is you will learn to think like nature. You will learn to understand the innate wisdom and intelligence of nature that allowed nature to be a healthy, amazing, um, almost miraculous system for millions of years. And then having learned to think like nature, you will also learn to design like nature, whether if it's actually a physical design, we'll walk through the framework, or if you have any other project, because design isn't just like a, a physical design. You could design a project, you could design uh, an idea or whatever it is. And then um, taking, uh, learning the, the, the impactful ways to actually implement it. So learning how to act like nature learning how to be stewards again and learning how to move the different pieces of the puzzle so that you could actually impact change. So yeah, um, that's my pitch and hopefully it captivated you and I look forward to having you over the next six weeks. Thank you.